Hi, I'm Dylan, and you're listening to the Animals at Home podcast. So today's episode is all about environmental enrichment for your reptile. Now, this is one of those controversial topics, or maybe it's not as much controversial as it is. You know, there's definitely two sides to it. Some people, there's a a faction of people that think you absolutely need environmental enrichment and there's another faction of people especially in this industrialized breeding age that we're in who think it's not necessary now what I plan to do here is hopefully by the time you've listened to this episode you come out from the other end with having a clear definition of what environmental enrichment is you'll be able to make a choice for yourself whether or not you think that it is necessary for your animal I do try to add as much academic sources and studies as possible to help you make your decision of course you're gonna see where I'm coming from I, I I wouldn't say I'm biased, I've just done my research and this is what I think. So I I am arguing for the fact that I do believe environmental enrichment is necessary. So you'll hear my side to things. Um, You know, the idea with a podcast like this is that I'm broadcasting my side and my argument to the world and hopefully someone can listen to this and retort and come back with, you know, other things that maybe are for or against the argument. You know, I'm of the opinion that the industrialized breeding age that we're in is not necessarily a good thing for the animal. You guys have heard me talk about that before. And I do mention some, you know, big names that I think are maybe slight reason for that. And I do talk about Brian Barczyk in this episode and my opinions on him. If you are listening and you're expecting one of those Facebook slam sessions where people attack Brian's character, this is not that. I am not about doing ad hominem attacks or character attacks. I actually think Brian does a lot of positive things for the hobby and I do talk about that as well. So I do criticize some of his points of view and then I also add some, you know, some of the things that I think he's doing that are really, really positive. So that is included in this episode as well. And I do highly encourage you to listen to the entirety of this episode before formulating your own opinion on it. This is a fairly complex issue, and I tried to lay out as much information as I could within the 60 minutes, but if you only listen to a fraction of it, you're not going to quite get the full picture of the idea and thought process that I lay out here. So so definitely try to listen to the entire thing, maybe take a couple days to do that. It's important that we look at the whole picture when we're discussing this. Before we get to the show, if you are interested in helping support the show, go to animalsathome.ca slash podcast, and you'll find a few different ways you can support it. Number one being share subscribe and comment enjoy the show welcome to today's episode so this episode is going to be slightly different than we're used to as i do not have a guest today this is just going to be me talking on the mic i'll do this on occasion it's not something i plan to do very often but once in a while when i feel like i have a thought in my head that i've been working out over the last few days i feel like why don't i just get on the mic record what my thoughts are and then we'll see if that turns into an episode or not maybe this will just be me talking into my office by myself and then just delete it afterwards. We'll find out. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, you'll see that I didn't video record this episode. And it's because it's probably, I think I'm going to probably record this over several days and I don't want it to be choppy and, and different, you know, clothes and video and things. So I thought we'll just do audio for this one because I do want to make sure that I clearly lay out this thought process or, or argument, I guess we could call it. So you guys can clearly follow along with what I'm doing. And, and it's going to take me a couple days to, to put that together. So today's topic is something that I've definitely discussed briefly on the show before with other guests. And simply put, the episode is going to be based around this one statement. Reptiles require environmental enrichment to reach a maximum level of health in captivity. And it is our duty as owners to provide that. So based off that statement, I'm going to lay out an episode of hopefully mostly objective information. Of course, there's tons of subjective information. I'm going to try to stay away from that as much as I can. Of course, everybody has, you know, some stories that they like to share, and I'll probably share a a couple stories with you guys. But I do have quite a few academic sources that I'm going to reference in this, just so I'm not just talking, you know, um, out of my own experience. I do want to make sure that there's an academic side to this discussion. And it's also a discussion that's very important to me. So I want to make sure that this is laid out in a way that if someone comes and listens to it, they can listen to the episode and then they can form their own argument for or against me or against me would be great because we're all going to kind of learn as, as we move through this. So this episode, I'm going to discuss why I believe that statement is true, i.e. the statement that I'm claiming that reptiles do require environmental enrichment to reach a maximum level of health and captivity. And I'm also going to discuss why I think the culture, the, 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 the reptile culture, care culture has shifted away from reptile enrichment. And I think, and also, you know, what we can do to maybe change that direction and make it move back towards 
in enrichment in a sense. And, you know, this is not to say that everybody has poor care or everybody is not following reptile and uh, or providing enrichment for their animals. There's plenty of people doing that. But I do think there are a lot of big players in our hobby that aren't. And, well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. Let's make sure we know what we're talking about here and, and then we'll break this down kind of step by step. So I guess really the first thing we need to do is define what I mean by envi environmental enrichment. And, and also the statement that I'm making, I'm not suggesting that reptiles require environmental enrichment to live because we know that's not the case. But I'm arguing is that they need environmental enrichment to maximize their health. And as owners, that should be our that should be our priority. Why wouldn't it be if we're, if we're taking these animals and, and putting them under our care, our goal should be to maximize their health. So again, I'm not suggesting that with environmental enrichment or sorry, without environmental enrichment, they will die. But you know, the next worst thing is that they're not living a, a fully healthy and, you know, living up to their full potential. So the definition I'm going to use for environmental enrichment comes out of a, a, you know, a very thorough paper called Reptile Wellness Management by Stacy Wilkinson. Now, I'm going to have most of this posted in the show notes, hopefully. Um, well, it will all be there. Whether or not you're going to be able to access some of these things, I actually have access to a university database that allows me to see certain papers. So if you don't have access to a university database, you may not be able to see these without paying for it. But you just have to take my word for it that I'm not bending the facts at all. And uh, if you actually did want to see it, you could you could pay whatever it costs to uh, to read the paper. Anyway, Enrichment means encouraging species appropriate behaviors and providing the animals with choices in every aspect of their husbandry, thus enhancing animal welfare. The goals for enrichment are to promote species appropriate behaviors, provide behavioral opportunities, and to provide animals with control of their environment. So I'm actually very satisfied with that definition. I hope you are as well. I think that does cover really the broad spectrum of what what we mean by environmental enrichment and this this allows us you know a foundation to have this conversation from and the author does actually finish off with two more sentences that i think are you know fairly crucial so other goals of environmental enrichment include reducing chronic stress reducing or eliminating aberrant behaviors and she also finishes the last sentence is each of these goals require a clear understanding of the animal's natural history in order to make the enrichment successful so again if we just talk about those three main goals which are to promote species appropriate behavior, to provide behavioral opportunities, and to provide the animal with control of their environment. I think that's a great starting point for us. So the question is, or the question that I'm raising, or the point that I'm raising is, those three things are necessary to make sure your animal is living at its maximum health. And I do think those three goals are relatively self-evident or self-explanatory, but maybe I'll break them down just a little bit so we can just be a little bit more robust with this foundation. Promoting species appropriate behavior. So obviously that requires you to go out and understand what that animal that you own behaves like in the wild. Are they a species that forages for food? Are they a scavenger? Are they a hunter? Are they an animal that burrows in the wild? Are they an arboreal species that climbs in the wild? This requires you to be a student of the animal, go out, learn, and then provide them with an environment that will allow those behaviors to kick in. Because you have to remember, these are wild animals. They you can think of it as a program that runs in them. You know, they are born with a natural instincts, and so are humans. But for, for animals, it's even simple, simpler. They are born with these natural instincts, and those instincts will switch on as soon as you provide them with an environment that the program is designed for. So understand the behaviors that your animal exhibits in the wild. Those are the behaviors you want to be seeing in your captive environment. And the next two are very much linked, providing behavioral opportunities for your animals and provide your animals with control over their environment. So obviously you can't give them ultimate control over their environment because they do need to stay in their cage, but you can allow them to obviously something as simple as a thermal gradient or a, or a temperature gradient throughout the enclosure allows them some control. Burrowing is a great way to allow, to, you know, to, to give your animal some control. Hunting, things along those lines, which promoting your animal to actually go out and, and have to behave like a wild animal. You know, I, I hate to pick on the ball python industry. And I'm going to try my best not to do that throughout this episode. And, and you guys know, I've said this before, I, I, I don't hate the ball python industry. I think ball pythons are really cool. You know, some of the morphs are very beautiful, but it is definitely the biggest culprit in this in this domain, I think. And, you know, a wild ball python in Africa is going to have to exhibit some type of behavior and take 
take some control of their environment in order just to survive, right? They're gonna have to problem solve in some way. And we'll get into learning in, in a little bit later in this episode. But they're gonna have to physically move, you know, they're gonna have to explore their environment to look for food or to, you know, get into a safe space or find different uh, thermal areas where there's heat or cool or, or whatever it is. When you see a ball python that's in a in a tub with a piece of newspaper and a water dish and it's curled up in the back and there's no hide, there's almost nothing. It is like the most sterile environment possible. You know, and every seven days a rat pops up in front of its face, it eats it, it coils it, it swallows it, and then it goes back to being just wrapped up on that warm side or maybe it moves up to the front side. That isn't right. You know, you know that in the wild, that's not how the snake behaves. We we absolutely know that. And as, as, as much as some owners like to argue that this is what they do in the wild anyway, that isn't what they do in the wild. There's just It's just not possible that a snake coils up, sits there, and waits for food to fall on its face every seven days. It's just not, this just doesn't happen. And we have to start being a little bit more honest with ourselves, I think. I mean, yes, even if in the wild, the animal spends 90% of its time burrowed. That might be true, but then we are really, really discounting that 10% of its time that's spent problem solving and, and acting like a wild animal, and we're not allowing it to live that way in captivity. And in my opinion, even if an animal spends 90% hiding in the wild, there's that 10% is still crucial to its development. So anyway, I don't, again, I don't want to get off on too many tangents here because I do want to keep this flowing in the right direction, and we will touch on a little bit more of that in a second. But again, you know, allowing them to exhibit some behaviors and have control over their environment is very important. So now that we have a fairly broad definition of environmental enrichment, the question still remains whether or not that is actually necessary to maximize your reptile's health or to maximize their life. So to answer that question, we're going to take a look at a couple of different things. And and the first thing we're going to look at is the most common reason for vet visits for reptile pets. And according to the Wilkinson article, the number one reason reptiles are brought to the vet is due to improper husbandry, which is actually a huge shame. Because what that's what that means is the most of the animals that are being brought to the vet because they're sick are sick due to the human not understanding how to care for them. And we already know, as animal owners, you know that an animal will get stressed when the parameters of the husbandry are not in, in tune with what they need, right? So if you have high humidities or high temperatures or low temperatures, low humidity, not enough hides, not enough climbing, you know, that's one of the first areas if someone posts, I'm having an issue with an animal on a Facebook group or a, a social media network or whatever, always the first few comments are, give me your stat, give me your temperatures, give me your humidities, let's take a look at your husbandry. Because we know that incorrect husbandry does stress out the animal and stress will cause illness and, you know, you do having an increased cortisol response in humans makes you sick. Of course, it's going to do the same thing with reptiles as well. And, and there are certain behaviors you can watch out for when you're trying to determine if your animal is stressed. And, you know, one of them would be pacing back and forth. One of them would be over aggression. One of them would be, you know, remaining in one spot and, and you never see them move. An animal should explore once in a while. They shouldn't stay in one spot for, you know, a reptile will stay in one spot for sometimes weeks on end right? If it's digesting or whatever it is, but once in a while, you should see some movement. And while we're talking about stress, I thought I would just read one more sentence out of this Wilkinson article, because I, I do think it's important. Improper husbandry conditions commonly create stress, as do constant changes, i.e. changing the substrate, cages, accessories, adding cage mates, including excessive handling or the cage being placed in a high traffic area. The stress response causes immunosuppression, leading to increased incidence of disease. So again, I think that's just a nice little tidbit to throw in there. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to do as much with enrichment as it does with, you know, there could be some other factors causing stress in your animal. So if you're somebody that has a stressed animal, those are some other things to look into. You know, reptiles don't necessarily love their cage to be changed all the time, right? I really don't change my cage much because I, I do know they get comfortable in that area. Putting them in a brand new environment is going to be kind of very stressful for them. And, and also handling can be quite stressful for the animals. So again, let's not go off on too many tangents here. I just thought that was an important tidbit to throw in. So how does environmental enrichment actually associate itself with the poor husbandry that we're seeing? Like the, the, the number one reason animals are being brought to the vet is through poor husbandry. How would environmental enrichment actually connect or, or help remedy that? Now, I, my theory is, and now whether or not this is true, I don't know, but I do 
I do honestly think that if you are required to go out and have to study the wild animal behaviors you're looking for in your captive animal, you're going to have a much stronger understanding of the husbandry that's going to be required for your animal. So whatever the animal is, if you went out and did your research on the wild animal, the you know the the wild counterpart to the animal that you're bringing home to your into a captive environment, and you are going to try to provide some of that enrichment that you see from when you study the wild counterpart, that is going to force you to understand that envir- that animal on a deeper level than it might from just the, you know, the three line care sheet that is on the pet smart or whatever whatever pet store you go to tag on the on the cage, you know, ball python, this is the temperatures, this is the humidity and you're good to go. You know, we we've all seen I mean, there's so many people on Facebook that will post something and 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 they are just they have totally missed the mark on their husbandry and and, and I think for those of us that really take our husbandry serious often we're kind of dumbfounded about how that can happen. Like it's very difficult for me to understand how someone can bring an animal home without understanding how to take care of it. And I mean, for example, the other day I was on Facebook and and I really do stay away from Facebook for the most part, but someone had posted a picture of a ball python they just got. It was like a day, they had had it for a day and on its neck, there was a bunch of scales that were missing basically. And, And he was the person who posted it was freaking out and saying, oh my goodness, I think the snake scraped up against one of the cork barks and his scales fell off. And, you know, everyone's like, ah, oh, that doesn't really seem likely. And, you know, let's let's get some more information about, about your setup. And long story short, I won't get into it too deeply, but he had a heat bulb unregulated, uncovered, and a heat mat in the enclosure with the animal. I think he had like a piece of tile over it or something, but it was still inside, inside the, the enclosure itself. And I mean, if there's two huge no-nos in in a reptile care. It's one, don't have an an exposed heat bulb, and two, never put electrical equipment into the enclosure. We know how dangerous this is, and both things weren't on the thermostat. And so, of course, the snake had burnt itself. And to me, that just tells me that this person didn't do an ounce of research. It's just not possible because, I mean, with those two heat sources, they were well over 110, 115 degrees on their hot side. The humidity must have been absolutely nothing with that, with those, especially the light bulb, you know, burning up any of the water vapor in the air. So what this tells us is basic information is not getting across. So there, there seems to be this gap. And, and if we promote environmental enrichment as the standard of your animal care, I'm, this is a theory. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true. I personally think it might improve the odds of having, you know, an individual like that. They may have spent, okay, maybe I need another three weeks before I bring home my ball python. I need to do a little more research to understand, you know, what environment I, I need to be replicating here. So I'd like to read one more thing before we move on from this specific topic. This is a line out of Reptile Medicine and Surgery, which is a, I assume it's a veterinary textbook written by Douglas Mater. This is a section from chapter four, which is general husbandry and management. I'm just going to read uh, half a paragraph here. A shift has been seen away from simple enclosures to those that are more environmentally enriched. More complex environments had traditionally been considered more difficult to maintain and were not being used for many reptiles. The benefits of such enriched enclosures have been become increasingly obvious over the, over the past several years. These benefits appear to be both behavioral and physiological. Increased environmental complexity leads to increased activity, which appears to result in leaner and more reproductively active animals. The physiological benefits of the microclimates within the enclosure include enabling the reptile to regulate body temperature and cutaneous water loss accurately. These benefits are believed to be extremely important in allowing the reptile to function normally and live to an age approximating genetic potential and are also critical for disease prevention. I don't think I need to say any more than that on this topic specifically. We're going to talk a lot more about this, but I think that really puts it into a nutshell. The evidence is already there. This is super important. But again, we can go a little bit further. I can, we can actually pull out some real studies that show if environmental enrichment does impact the mental acuity of the animals. So the first study we're going to take a look at is called Environmental Enrichment alters the behavioral profile of rat snakes by Amelie and Burghardt. So in the study, the researchers took 18 rat snakes and divided them into two groups. One they subjected to what they call a standard condition environment, and the other one was an enriched condition. So the nine rat snakes that were subjected to the standard conditions were basically kept in a regular laboratory, I believe it would have been some kind of plain tub with a that were lined with corrugated paper for substrate. They had no climbing uh, vertical object for the animals to climb up on, and they were fed 
just dead prey. On the other hand, the nine rat snakes that were subjected to the enriched conditions were housed in an environmentally enriched conditions. So they were fed live prey. They had aspen shedding for substrate. They had a half coconut shell on top of a branch to simulate a cavity in a tree. And they had a plastic container filled with sphagnum moss. So they had some different you know, areas of the enclosure that they were capable of exploring. And it's probably really important to quickly just stop for a second and, and make sure you guys understand that I'm definitely not recommending you feed live rodents to your animals. Of course, live insects is another story. Live insects are fantastic. Those are great. I, I would never recommend feeding live, in, uh, live rodents. I don't even need to get into that because you already understand. This was a laboratory condition. They were using that to study the difference between feeding live prey and leaving and feeding dead prey of course feeding live prey is going to be more enriching to your animal that goes without saying but then as keepers we must weigh the consequences and the positives and the negatives and the negatives in for feeding live prey obviously outweigh the the positives so again we're not promoting live prey this is just for the study so after eight months of being subjected to those different conditions either the standard condition or the enriched condition these researchers then performed a series of tests. The first test they, they did was a problem-solving task. So they took a wooden disc, so you can imagine this looking so somewhat like a clock, and at each number on the clock was a hole. And one of those holes was dictated as the, or designated as the goal hole. And if in the goal hole was basically a tunnel that led into a refuge with moist paper towels. So just basically like a small hide. And the other 11 holes were blocked with cardboard on the op opposite side. So you could almost kind of start to go through the hole and then you would get, you would get stuck or the snake would get stuck. So they ran this test in three, in three different ways. Uh, one was just the test as it is. The second way they ran it was they used a scent trail from the middle of the disc right to the goal hole by dragging a prey or a mouse right across and then the third way was they actually put a mouse into the refuge and after testing both groups several times they discovered that the environmentally enriched group the group that lived in the environmentally enriched enclosures were able to find the goal holes more quickly than the ones kept in the standard condition specifically the article states that the snakes housed in the enriched environments exhibited shorter latencies to the goal hole as compared to the house the snakes housed in the standard conditions and specifically they state that this may be due to an improved level of problem solving ability so the second test they performed on the animals was what they called an open field test and, and this test was designed to see how the animal would respond to a novel stimulus so what they did is they took a 95 by 65 or sorry a 95 by 95 by 60 centimeter box made out of plywood they painted it all black and on the floor they just basically dropped down a layer of plastic or of corrugated plastic and then they created a grid system right across the floor so you could the entire floor was completely gridded and this is inside a black box basically what they did is they would drop the animals into the box and they were looking for three different measurements one was the number of tongue flicks two was the amount of distance they traveled from a horizontal direction so they had a camera pointing down and they could watch the snake slither across the grid and they would count how many grid spaces it moved and then the third one was how often the snake reared up so you can imagine you've seen your snakes do this before if you have snakes where they lift their head and they start slithering up the side of the wall they're in that exploratory mode so you can imagine this is a perfect test to see how a snake responds. So are they going to be thrown into that environment and curl up and go, go into a sort of a defensive stressed state or are they going to explore? So they found there was no significant main effect of the enrichment on the three exploratory behaviors. So they couldn't actually conclude that the enriched snakes had an increased exploratory behavior. However, they did observe that the enriched snakes were able to habituate to the repeated exposure of the experiment. So as they continuously put the snakes into the black box, the enriched snakes were more comfortable and were more quick to start exploring than the, the uh, standard condition animals. So they suggest that the enriched snakes were less fearful of exploring new environments. And it's probably worth noting here that similar effects have been found on rodent studies rather than reptiles. Rodents that are subjected to more enriching conditions tend to habituate quicker to novel environments. And as the article says here, this is generally considered a sign of more intelligence. And the third and final test they did was they basically exposed the two groups of snakes to different feeding opportunities. So for the enriched snakes that were commonly eating or were always eating live foods, they subjected them to dead prey and then vice versa for the standard snakes. And basically what they were looking for or what they assumed what they were going to see was the animals that were 
enriched, the ones that we're constantly dealing with live prey, were going to be a lot more adaptable at eating a different type of prey. So they were going to be able to transfer their their skills from eating live prey to dead prey more quickly. And, and in the end, the result was both snakes were readily able to eat their food. There was basically no difference between flip-flopping the, the prey. The rat snakes were going to go for live prey or dead prey, regardless of what they had been fed during the eight-month period where they were subjected to their specific conditions. So I guess technically that does prove that feeding live prey actually doesn't really enrich the animal that much. So that's another good reason to actually not feed live. And the second study I wanted to mention is a study called Does Enrichment Improve Reptile Welfare? Leopard geckos respond to five different types of environmental enrichment. This article is written by Bashaw, Gibson, Sho, and Kutcher. So this study took 16 male leopard geckos and exposed them to different types of enrichment. Each type of enrichment had two different modes. We'll call them modes. The first one was the visual enrichment. So for the visual enrichment, they showed the geckos a mirror. And on the opposite day, they'd show them the same mirror, but the mirror was reversed so they could only see the back. So obviously, one day they could see the reflection and one day they were just looking at the back opaque mirror. For the olfactory enrichment, so the scent, they used two different types of blocks. One block smelt like mint and another block had snakeskin mixed into it. So I guess it smelt like snakeskin. There was feeding enrichment uh, in which the animals were presented with two different puzzle feeders. The first one was called a pet safe fun kitty egg size cat toy, uh, some sort of strange cat toy. And the other one was essentially just a 30 centimeter long PVC pipe capped at one end. And both of these feeders are clear. And when they were testing it, they would throw four crickets inside the, the puzzle feeder and the gecko would actually be able to see them. And then they sort of measured how long it took the, the gecko to, to get them out. The fourth type of enrichment was object enrichment in which they had two different types of dog rubber dog toys. One was a rubber ball and one was basically like a rubber tube. And the last type of enrichment was thermal enrichment. So essentially they had their heat bulb in the enclosure and they gave the animals two different types of perches to get up towards the heat. One was a branched type sort of natural looking climbing apparatus and the other one was they call it a flexi trail which I think I kind of understand what that is. It says 21 wood slats sort of wired together so they have a bit of a flex, so it creates kind of like a bridge. So both of these apparatus allowed the animals to climb up towards the heat, but also when they go under them, they would have some shade. So I don't want to spend too much time breaking down this paper because it is a very interesting paper, so I'll post it in the show notes and you can take a look at it if you get a chance. But essentially, they took these types of stimulus and they compared when they introduced them to the leopard geckos they were looking for behavioral difference between when they could interact with the enrichment and then their control test, which is just the, the gecko in sort of just a plain environment. So what their test was designed to do was to see how their, the enrichment affected areas of welfare. So specifically, the four behavioral measures they associated with welfare were one, increased ex exploration, two, increased species-specific behavior, so specifically thermal regulatory behavior and foraging, three, increased behavioral diversity, and four, decreased aberrant repetitive behaviors. So obviously aberrant re re repetitive behaviors would definitely be associated with stress. I'm just gonna read a couple little excerpts from their discussion and then, and then we'll move on. Feeding and thermal enrichment significantly increased walking and climbing, and object enrichment significantly increased walking. Within the olfactory exploration, enrichment had a significant effect on tongue touching and sniffing. Compared to baseline, feeding enrichment significantly increased all three of the olfactory behaviors. And those behaviors are basically sniffing, using their tongue to taste the air, and using their tongue to taste an object or lick an object. Thermal enrichment significantly increased tongue touching and lip licking, and olfactory and object enrich enrichment significantly increased tongue touching. And compared to the baseline, feeding thermal olfactory and object en enrichment significantly increased object manipulation. So again, I'm not going to break down this article too much more, but essentially what they found was there was an increased level of activity and behavior that the leopard geckos were showing when they were exposed to this enrichment, especially the, f the feeding enrichment and the thermal enrichment elicited the highest response, which makes sense because these animals are kind of in that survival wild mode. So they are going to behave in a way that is towards survival goals. So thermal regulation is a huge survival goal. And of course, so is hunting and feeding. So it doesn't have to be super complicated, but just allowing them to have some control over their environment is going to push them into behaving as they should in the wild or as they would in the wild. And the fact that the enrichment was causing the geckos to move around their enclosure more and explore more 
it would be very difficult to argue against that that's a good thing. I mean, we're not talking about stress movement back and forth, pacing or, or trying to get out. They're actively interacting with their environment. That is a good thing. So I'll just leave you with one of their concluding sentences before we move on. We conclude that providing novel objects improve welfare in leopard geckos by increasing their propensity for exploration. These items should be provided, but preference given to enrichment like puzzle feeders, climbing and shade structures, and warm or cool substrates that address strongly motivated behaviors like feeding and thermal regulation. So again, this is very simple. We're not talking about, you know, taking a leopard gecko and training it to be able to do something, you know, that, that would be a very high level of enrichment that you would expect from something like a mammal. But if you have the gecko in a rack system in a very small tub, and really the only control that it has is by thermal regulating itself between the back, which is warm, and the front, which is cool, we can do a lot better than that. You can provide puzzle feeders, or if you had a bigger enclosure, you could provide something for it to climb on so it can have more you know, change in its thermal regulation. Like you have to imagine in a tub, yes, they can thermal regulate, but imagine if in a larger enclosure where they have a shaded area and an area where they can climb, imagine how much more opportunity they have to thermal regulate, right? There's going to be way more gradient for them rather than, you know, the front of a tub and then 12 inches or 10 inches forward the, the back, which is a little bit warmer than the front. So it is really all about watching your animals and reading their behaviors and trying to understand what behaviors you are trying to get rid of and which ones you're trying to promote. You don't want to listen to this episode and then go right to your reptiles enclosure and then add a million different things in there to make it like there's a bunch of different things they can react or interact with. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is we can do a lot more in terms of providing an environment for the animals to interact with. You know, it's very bizarre that we went down this path with reptiles. And, and really, I mean, I think lizards, it seems to be a little bit better. The snakes are the ones that really are treated poorly, in my opinion, due to the lack of environmental enrichment. Think about every other pet that we have. Birds, we provide them with environmental enrichment. Dogs, cats, even fish. Now fish, I mean, I own fish. I owned Malawi cichlids. I provided them with a rock system that allowed them to behave exactly like they would in the wild because the bottom of Lake Malawi is full of rocks. Now, guess what they did? They instinctively used those rocks as as caves and hides, and it was awesome to see. So I even did that with my fish, and a lot of people sort of inadvertently do that with their, their fish. Even if they're adding like a fake ship into the, their aquarium, they're still providing a natural hide or, or in quotes, natural hide for, for their fish. Almost every other type of pet, rats, um, rabbits, everything we have has something that we're providing it to interact with their environment except for snakes. And the evidence is showing that enrichment does make a difference. Because this is the statement we, oft we often always hear. It doesn't make a difference to the snake. The snake has no idea. It is just as happy in a completely sterile plain tub as it would be in something that's a little bit more enriching or you know quite often we hear people say the enriching is bad for the snake because it stresses them out now what that implies is that the snakes don't learn and they can't interact with things at what which is obviously very false and there's actually tons of evidence that show reptiles do learn now a lot of these studies are few and far between as we are just getting there now the a lot of these studies happened with mammals and birds and reptiles are just kind of getting into that limelight with scientific research so most of this stuff is brand new so we kind of have to bear with the research but there is research coming out that show animals or sorry, reptiles can learn. And it's kind of obvious that they can learn because if they couldn't learn, they would never be able to survive in a wild environment. Now, I think part of the confusion is, is when we say learning, a lot of people automatically think like, tell your, telling your dog to sit or, you know, teaching a bird how to talk. Some of these behaviors in reptiles, their learning is not as complex as you might think when you think of the word learning. But there is actually quite a lot of evidence showing there is some fairly complex learning behaviors in reptiles that you actually might not be aware of. So I'm staring at another article written by Gordon Berghart, which was one of the authors on the rat snake study. Now this particular article is called Environmental Enrichment and Cognitive Complexity in Reptiles and Amphib Amphibians concepts, reviews, and implications for captive populations. So essentially, this is, an art, this is a paper or an article written and sort of reviewing a bunch of different researches. So I'm not going to go crazy into this, but I will read a few excerpts just to prove that there is some fairly complex learning behaviors that's been documented in reptile species. So to quote, 
Turtles, crocodilians, and lizards have all been shown to be quite adept at most traditional learning tasks if the problem accommodates their sensory abilities and behavioral repertoires. So those last two sta statements are very important because maybe some of the learning we are expecting from the reptiles is sort of outside of their you know, typical behavioral rep uh, repertoires or their sensory abilities. So we can't ask them to do more than they can perceive. But having said that, Monitors, large tortoises, and crocodilians have all been successfully targeted trained in zoos and in captive settings. So obviously some of these animals, especially the monitors and crocodilians, are very dangerous and they can be, you know, a tough animal to have in captivity. So one of the ways that they handle them is they target train them so they can be much safer to work with. So I'll share just two really quick points from uh, some documented reptile learning. The first one is from this same article and it says, quote, red belly cooters, which are a species of turtle that lives in the United States, can readily be trained to climb out of water and knock over a bottle for a food pellet. And they can retain both the behavior and the discrimination for at least two years without any training, which means they can teach them to do this task. And then two years later, they can come back without any training in between then. And they can, the animals will follow through with this behavior. And the second learning story is out of an article called Using Operant Conditioning and Desen Desensitization to Facilitate Veterinary Care with Captive Reptiles. And this is by Helmuth and Augustine Watkins and Hope. So this is just a really quick story from that article, and it's basically about a zoo in Vienna, Austria, who had ordered four Cayman lizards from a breeding farm in Peru. So, you know, breeding farms are kind of that gray area where they're sort of wild or not really wild caught, but most likely their parents were wild caught and then forced to breed in sort of these strange farm conditions. And then those animals were shipped off to the zoo. So essentially they had this uh, large enclosure for them, but they had some serious behavioral issues. And you know, I actually saw my first Cayman lizard for the first time a couple weeks ago. I had I knew what they looked like, but I didn't realize quite how big they get. And it turns out they get quite large. I mean, a full-grown Cayman lizard can be about four four feet long at 10 pounds. They are a really, really cool looking lizard. So if you don't know what it looks like, definitely Google it. But these are not the type of lizard that you want to have as an aggressive species in a large enclosure. So long story short, one of the female lizards became very dominant and very aggressive towards the others. She was eating all the snails. This is a species that basically primarily eats snails. She was injuring the other lizards and also sort of forcing them to perpetually hide from her. So to mitigate these problems, the, the team that was working with these animals decided to implement a training program. So the purpose of the training program was to be able to feed each animal individually, but also be able to handle them and, and, and you know, do a checkup on each lizard to make sure that they were healthy. They couldn't do that if the animals were very scared and very aggressive. So basically they started clicker training these animals. And I'm sure you're familiar with clicker training. It's essentially you're, when you give the animal a reward like food, you also create a clicking sound with this little clicker device and the animal starts to associate the click with food. And eventually they transition that into target training, which is sort of the same idea, which allows you to use a stick and you know the animal will come up and tap the stick or tap the pole or whatever you're using. And that then they know that when they do that, they get the reward of food. So eventually they taught these lizards to be able to walk through tunnels, walk into crates, into boxes. They were able to desensitize these animals to different materials like leather because that's the type of gloves they were they were uh, they would wear when they handled them. So they wanted them to become desensitized uh, to that material, and this allowed them to weigh the animals and take them for X-rays. So. All in all, this allowed the animals to be more relaxed around the keepers. And actually, the last closing, closing sentence or the closing paragraph of this story says, the training program has been very successful in helping to better and more safely manage this amazing species. The staff discovered that in addition to easier and less stressful handling, the lizards are now more relaxed in the presence of the keepers and they show less aggression to each other within the group, which is really amazing. So not only did the target training help them manage the species between the lizard and the human interactions, the lizards within the enclosure actually became more relaxed. And I'd, I have no idea why that would be. Maybe you can think of a, different, a couple different reasons, but long story short, these animals were taught to be target trained. Reptiles can learn. Now their learning is going to be is going to look different for every species. Some species are going to be more advanced than others, but there is going to be some capacity to learn in each reptile. 
Okay, so up to this point now, we have shown that, you know, there is some really good research showing that reptiles can learn, and there's some really good research showing that enrichment does increase the proper behaviors that we want to see in our captive animals and reduce stress. Now, there is a kind of a little bit of a flaw in my argument at this point, because besides the rat snake study that does show or suggest that enrichment does potentially create a more intelligent animal after enriching the animals, you know, early eight, first eight months of their life. Now, that's a that's a great uh, piece of research, but the problem with what I'm demonstrating here, I'm, or I'm trying to demonstrate, is the rest of the research that I've shown has been in lizards, monitors, crocodilians, and turtles. Now, especially when I was talking about learning, I w only referenced basically crocodilians, monitors, lizards, and turtles. And there's actually a a reason for that, and the reason is is that the research showing that snakes can learn is very, very sparse. And because of that, that sort of weakens my argument at this point, because I've been kind of hard on the snake hobbyists throughout this podcast saying that there's a lot of people doing the sort of the industrialized setup, and I feel like they should be enriching the lives of their animals more. But then I kind of fail to show that snakes can learn. So the question is, can snakes learn? And the answer is, we don't necessarily know because the research isn't there. But if we use the evidence of the other reptile species to sort of extrapolate what we think might be going on, I personally believe that snakes can learn. And just the research hasn't got to the point to be able to prove that. Because it would be, I, I now this is me talking completely subjectively. I think it would be very strange if all, th all those branches of reptiles kind of went off their separate ways. And for some reason, the crocodilians, turtles, tortoises, and uh, lizards all were able to learn. And then the snakes for some reason lost the ability for, for some sort of, you know, conditioning and, and learning. Of course, that's not any proof. That's just my thoughts. Now, there is one significant difference between snakes and those other reptile species. Now, I'll give you two seconds to think about what that is. It's very easy to think about. They don't have legs and they don't have arms. Now, that's kind of sounding a little bit funny, but it is actually very significant because what it means is snakes really do don't have the ability to manipulate the environment around them. They can a little bit through burrowing and things, but nothing like an animal with four legs. It's just not comparable. So what that, what I think that means is that snakes learn and exhibit learning and behaviors in a different way. There's something different going on with snakes that I feel like science hasn't uncovered yet. We haven't been able to build a study because all of our studies models are based off of animals with four legs, animals which who can manipulate an environment, right? Think about rat studies. You're thinking about rats kind of, you know, pushing objects or taking, you know, colored balls over to one side to the other side. You're not going to be able to do that with snakes. They can't. They can't grasp things and and you know manipulate the world around them, which probably means that's a whole side of learning that they don't necessarily need, use, or maybe not even have. That doesn't mean they don't learn. That just means we don't know how they learn or in what sort of mechanism their brain stores information and you know becomes conditioned. So I'm using the evidence of the other reptile species because of how successful those learning studies have been and that rat snake study to make a assumption that snakes have the capacity to learn and that enrichment is vital for them. So having said all of that, the question still remains, how did we end up with a hobby where there's a large faction of its members who are not enriching the animals' lives that they care for? Now. I actually don't think it has much to do with, you know, looking into scientific facts or, or academic evidence because people tend to not look into that research to determine how they do things. I mean, I don't think people who own rats or birds are reading academic papers to see if enrichment is necessary. They just seem to do it more naturally with other animals. And for some reason, the reptile industry has slipped into this sort of industrialized care rather than, you know, animal first type care. And I do really think one of the main reasons for that is the breeding industry that's grown over the last 10 years. So breeding reptiles has become an extremely popular side to the hobby that you don't see in other hobbies as much. You don't, or sorry, in, in other pet hobbies as much. For some reason, breeding reptiles has become very popular. And I think mainly due to the fact that it's, well, the morphs obviously uh, pay 
play a huge role in that. But then also it's fairly easy to breed reptiles. You know, now that the sort of the hard legwork was done 10, 10 years ago or so by some of those founding members who were breeding into the industry, now really anybody can pick up a couple animals and start breeding. And, and partly that's cool because people can add that sort of advancement to their hobby and, and get an extra level of enjoyment out of it by challenging themselves in a new area. But then obviously partly there's a huge negative to it. And this is how I think we've found ourselves in this spot. Breeding has become very industrialized and that is where like, there's no question where the, the unenriched environments we're keeping our animals in has come from. Like that was birthed out of the breeding in the industry, you know, the, the very plain tubs, the sheet of newspaper and the bowl, the racking system that obviously all came out of the breeding industry because no one would keep an animal in a tub if they didn't want to, if they weren't keeping, you know, a hundred animals. Tubs are not an exciting way to keep an animal. You can't show your friends or family them without having to open tubs and, and whatnot. And it doesn't make a good display. So we know that that industrialized care came out of that breeding world. Now to play my own devil's advocate, I would say, if I was a breeder, I would tell myself this. I would say, hey, you probably don't understand what it's like to take care of 50, 60, 70, 100 animals at once. And the reason that we care for animals the way we do with the sheet of paper, the water dish, and the tub is because we do care for the animals first. Animals are our number one priority, and we we care for them this way to ensure everything is clean and sterile and things can't be, you know, an, your animals aren't going to get each other sick. We can maintain a very healthy and, you know, hospital type environment. And my response to that is actually, I think that's okay. I think that is actually maybe one valid argument for the rack system and the very plain sterile environment because you are dealing with a large a quantity of animals and to keep everybody healthy and clean, maybe having too much enrichment opportunities inside each enclosure would actually end up being harmful for the animals because you have way too much to maintain. And if an animal gets mites, for example, you're going to have this huge breakout that you're never going to get under control. So that's fine, but here is where the catastrophe, in my opinion, happened. The catastrophe happened when animal breeders or reptile breeders started selling animals to the general public and showed them the way they were caring for the animals and sold them that way, saying, this is all you need to care for this ball python. You just need a plastic tub, a sheet of paper, and a bowl of water, and you're good to go. And then you send somebody home with their first and only ball python that's caring for it in the same way that someone who has an industrialized breeding operation cares for them. And I think over time, that has caused the sterile breeding industrialized style care to become the norm rather than just the breeding standard. Like I said, I can understand that as being a breeding standard, but it shouldn't be the standard of care for the person that has a single ball python because as we've already showed in this episode, reptiles require enrichment to fully maximize their genetic potential. And we've already showed that one of the main reasons animals are brought to the vet is through poor understanding of the husbandry. The animals are getting sick and stressed because they're not being taken care of properly. And I think that's one of the main shames of caring for an animal in an industrialized sense is it completely disassociates that animal with its wild counterpart. It's very difficult to picture a leopard gecko in the wild when you only interact with ones in small Ziploc containers or little Ziploc Tupperware tubs with the paper towel substrate and the half styrofoam like meat container for a for a hide when you interact with leopard geckos like that on a daily basis we actually start to forget that these are wild creatures that live on the earth in the wild and the same goes for ball pythons and every other industry that's gone over industrialized and as i said at the beginning that disconnection is what's causing people to not fully understand how to care for their animals and it's causing us to be num the number one reason they go to the vet is because we don't know how to take care of our animals so if the standard of care was, hey, you need to understand what the sub-Saharan climate and environment looks like for a ball python in the wild, that's what you're trying to replicate. And then the kid goes, oh, okay, give me like two months or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks at least to go research that so when I come home I understand how to care for this animal rather than here's your plastic tub, here's your newspaper, and here's a deli cup, which I'm going to throw out every day and create a ton of plastic waste. 
sorry, I just had to throw that in there. Industrialized care does not promote understanding your animal. It just doesn't. And as I said, we have some very big players in our hobby that are perpetuating this idea, or at least were perpetuating this idea. And I'm going to pick on Brian Barczyk for a second because I think he's one of the biggest culprits or was one of the biggest culprits of perpetuating this idea. And I know he gets a lot of hate online and there's all sorts of Facebook groups that are, you know, trashing him. And I'm not at all saying that's what I'm about to do. I'm not willing to attack someone's character. I don't do ad hominem attacks. Really what I'm looking at is what the message that Brian is giving or has in the past given people who are just getting into the hobby. So what I want to do here is I want to play you a clip from about 10 months ago. And in this clip, he is answering the question that he must always get all the time is, do those snakes really live in those tubs? It looks so boring. And just take a listen how he answers that question. Which brings me to my next question, which is, do those snakes live in those little tubs? What is up with that? Why don't they have trees and plants and all kinds of other things? So let's go ahead and take a look and see what's going on in this beautiful piebald ball python right here. And the truth is, sometimes us as humans start to kind of put our own human thoughts into things and thinking like, oh my gosh, the snake just basically has a tub and a water dish and that's it. And I get it. I totally get it. And I'm not saying that having a beautiful vivarium is a bad idea whatsoever because it's really cool. But I can tell you this much, the majority of what you see in a beautiful vivarium is for you, not for your snake. What happens here is it has a hot spot right here, it has a cold spot, it has a water dish, and the way these tubs are made right here, it actually is almost like a little bit of a hide box in itself because it's really kind of secluded and it doesn't see a lot of commotion and so like that. So basically, let me talk about what snakes' needs are. Snakes need the proper temperature, the proper humidity, they need water, they need food, and they love to breed and that's about it really the majority of the time in the wild snakes will really spend almost all of their time kind of hiding in the roots of trees or in a cave or something like that crammed into really tight spots that doesn't mean that you can't give them more space but the truth is a lot of snakes when you increase the size of their environment you actually stress them out so let me give you an example if you have a ball pipe in a tub just like this and it's doing fine and great and then you decide to move it to a 50 gallon aquarium that has all these beautiful beautiful plants and rocks and things for it to climb on, it actually may stop feeding because it may go, oh my God, I am completely stressed out. I don't like that. And again, I'm not saying that it's a bad thing. It's a great thing to have vivariums. As a matter of fact, next door, we're going to have a bunch of naturalistic, really cool type vivariums for people to enjoy. And I am super geeked on it. It's going to be absolutely incredible. With that said, it's more about us viewing it than anything. And again, I don't want to get into a debate whether or not you should keep a snake in rack or you should keep it in a vivarium. I'm just saying that snakes are completely happy and healthy when they have an environment just like this little beautiful piebald here. It's got everything it possibly needs. Let's now, it's not really fair for me to just completely break down everything that he said and prove that it's all wrong and, and not necessarily like some of the stuff he's saying is accurate, but I don't want to have a one-sided conversation and just, you know, tear apart one side without having Brian to be able to respond to some of that stuff. But just to touch on a few of those things... Of course, he is right that if you do take a tub, a snake that's been living in a tub for its whole life, and then you put it into a, you know, a busy vivarium, it's probably going to have a hard time adjusting. But that doesn't mean that doesn't need to have that enrichment. It might mean that maybe the enrichment should have started easier or you should have eased its way into it a little bit more or started earlier. I mean, if the snake has spent, you know, five years in a tub, it's not going to adjust to a vivarium at all. If you listen to my interview with Josser's Jungle, she had that exact same experience taking a tub snake and trying to get it adjust to a, a you know a planted vivarium or a not a vivarium but you know a terrarium that was a little bit natural um, decor and the the snake went off food. And as we've already shown, a lot of that what he just said is actually untrue. The animals do respond to a lot more than just than the enrichment. It's not just for the human and. I would just have so much rather prefer if he had said something along the lines of this is the way I care for them because I work in a giant breeding facility and it must be sterile, but this is not how you have to care for it. But instead, it sort of implies that this is 100% fine and really the evidence does not show that. And again, just because an animal spends 90 to 95% of its time, you know, burrowed and under a rock or under a root in the wild, it doesn't mean that that 5% of the time where it's not doing that, where it's actively, you know, that 5% where it's actively moving around and actively in quotes problem solving, to whatever extent that animal has the capacity to problem solve, it doesn't mean that that 5% is not important for its development. It actually 
is because that 5% is the difference between that snake not living and that snake living. Now, I don't want to go back and say, look at all this evidence that shows that he's wrong because we've already talked about the evidence. And and as I said earlier, this is a new st- field of study and, and not a lot of this stuff is necess- necessarily public knowledge and out there. And it's not a meme within the reptile community yet. So, so as far as keeping an animal in the environment that Brian just described, I think is either lazy or the owner trying to just to be cheap because you could go out and look for the evidence and see that 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 is just not the right way to care for an animal. And the the other thing he had mentioned is that, you know, all that extra decoration is just for the human, the human eye rather than the animal. And I mean, to an extent, he's right, but I think he he doesn't mean it in the way that I, that I mean it. And so what, what I mean is when you're adding enrichment into your animal's enclosure, so maybe you're adding shelves or climbing branches, you know, to the snake or the gecko or whatever you have, they're not really going to tell, be able to tell the difference between, you know, just a PVC pipe that acts as a climbing branch or a fake wood or, a, you know, a fake wood climbing branch. Although there obviously would be some scent and some texture, the ability for them to climb is the enrichment and, you know, the appearance is maybe less important. As humans, we love to look in, or at least I do, I love to look into a terrarium and see, a, you know, a natural wild looking setup. To an animal, having their enclosure look like a slice of nature is probably less important than having the enrichment factors included. So, you know, you've seen those people that create, you know, their leopard gecko enclosure and it kind of looks like a dollhouse or something. They have like a small bed. Maybe there's a hide that looks like a bed and there's uh, different rooms, whatever. For me, that doesn't appeal to me at all. But at the same time, it probably does accomplish a lot of those enrichment qualities that I've been talking about. If there's a climbing area, if there's different hides, if there's a place where they can burrow, the reptile probably doesn't care as much about the appearance as we do, but it's these, including those enrichment factors that matter. Although if you do go back to that third episode that I had recorded with, with TC Houston, he did mention that his, he read that skinks can see color and especially the color green. And that was one of the things that he, as soon as he read that, he ran out to the store to buy a bunch of fake plants because he wanted to enrich them in that way. So, you know, at the same time, it's accomplishing, looking pleasing to the human eye. It is a form of enrichment for the skink. So the reason I actually feel comfortable, you know, playing that clip of Brian and taking it apart a little bit is because I do truly think, and as I said, I don't like having a one-sided conversation. I think that's unfair for the person that we're arguing against. Like I'm having basically arguing against my own imagination here, which is totally unfair to Brian. But the reason I did that is because I do truly think that he would maybe not defend that as hard now as he would have about a year ago. And the reason being is it seems like the experience he's had with the opening the Reptarium or the zoo that he's just recently opened has maybe shifted his mindset a little bit because everything in that zoo is a natural setup. It's not all bioactive enclosures, but they all do have some natural elements and rock looking things and allowing the animals to interact with, uh, you know, you know, more control over their enclosure, like we talked about at the beginning, or more control over their environment. And whether or not you think the Reptarium is a good idea or not, I actually love the idea. I, I really have enjoyed watching some of those videos of him opening it. I mean, you, you might be able to say that having those animals handled as much as they are might not be good for them, although we already have covered that animals can learn and they can be habituated to things. And I know he's worked with those animals for a long time, so they can be handled. So maybe the stress response in those animals is not as high as others. I mean, that's probably almost a guarantee. But I think the positives that are coming from that zoo are incredible. The amount of people that he's probably changing minds about snakes and reptiles, it seems like every time he, he opens the doors, someone else leaves having a positive experience when they went in thinking snakes were horrible and, and, you know, reptiles were creepy little creatures. And the expression on his face and the excitement in his voice when he talks about it really shows that I think that is very important to him. And I'd like to play just two more quick clips of him. And this first clip is when he released his 20-foot reticulated python Lucy into her huge, I can't remember the dimensions of this enclosure, but a very large enclosure with a climbing wall and a, and a waterfall feature. And uh, this is what he had to say. I literally feel like a little kid right now. I mean, I never expected in a million years for her to immediately find the tree and find probably what's gonna be her favorite spot. You know, when we built this cage, I thought she'd probably hang on here in the water for sure, over here. Never really thinking she was gonna be up in a tree like that. 
This goes to show you how much reticulated pythons like to climb. And I'm gonna be completely honest and transparent here. This really does make me kind of think a lot about keeping reticulated pythons in cages where they can't climb because, I mean, within 30 seconds, the first thing she did was find the highest spot in the cage. So, wow. I don't even, I mean, I am just brimming. This is. And this last clip is him just taking a look at another one of his reticulated pythons named Casper. And this, the snake in the video clip is actually climbed up and sort of perched himself up on one of the rock walls that they have made. And this is what he has to say here. I know I've said it before, but I think it's really cool. Look at how Casper is using the side to climb on and stuff like that. Sometimes he'll even get up on this ledge right over here. I just love the fact that these guys are using these cages so much. I think it gives them just that extra enrichment, you know what I mean? Kind of learning how to climb and stuff like that. He's probably actually never climbed his whole life before getting in this habitat, so I think it's amazing. So again, that's actually really good evidence to show that these animals have that genetic code in them that dictates the behaviors that they will display if you give them the enrichment to do so. So he had mentioned that this likely his snake Casper had never been exposed to climbing before, but now he climbs all the time because in the wild, they do climb, you know, there you find them in caves and rock walls all the time. That's how they dis that's how they act in the wild. And once Casper was given the opportunity to, to do that with the, you know, the fake rock backgrounds, boom, he starts doing it. So I have to say that is pretty cool of him to sort of admit to, you know, maybe potentially rethinking the way he cares for his animals and, and especially those reticulated pythons. And I mean, that's what everybody should be doing all the time when they care for animals. You're never done learning. But I think for him, he has such a huge following and he's done a lot to sort of promote the hobby. Whether or not you think it's good or bad, I think right now what he's doing is really beneficial and it might be opening his eyes. So, oh my goodness, like look, look at these animals, like watching them behave as they would in the wild is so much more gratifying as a keeper than, you know, keeping them in tubs and racks and, and whatnot. And the care that we should be promoting is that. We should all be striving for that. So again, I'm not interested in throwing Brian under the bus without him, without having him here to defend himself. I, you know, I, I'm not for character attacks or ad hominem attacks. Not at all. I do think certain eyes ideas can be criticized and you know I actually do enjoy a lot of the stuff that he puts out especially now with the zoo I think that's a really interesting project he's working on I think the benefits for the hobby is huge and I do think there is some transition that he's having in terms of the way he views the hobby you know I'm criticizing the way he was talking about keeping snakes in tubs but the only reason I'm doing that is because I do truly think he may not defend that quite as hard as he would have a year ago so what he might be able to do is because of his audience is so vast and now a lot of the content that he's producing is really showing animals in enriched environments I would have a hard time arguing that that's a bad thing now his earlier stuff may have promoted the industrialized care but as he grows and he gets bigger and he's almost has 2 million subscribers on YouTube you know people are now going to be exposed on a daily basis to enriched environments now I know the handling maybe ha over handling animals you could you could really take that apart you know as I said I don't necessarily mind that as a lot of those animals have been habituated I probably wouldn't personally handle animals that much but he's worked with those animals they probably don't respond as poorly as other animals to being handled but the positive impact it has on the average person or the public is huge so I hope I'm not putting words in his mouth because I mean as a viewer I can personally see the excitement in his voice and in his, you know, face when he's opening the reptarium or he, when he's working on it and now that it's opened. And I do truly think that that is, you know, his, he's truly having a transition in the hobby and hopefully he doesn't mind me criticizing him a little bit, but really I'm not criticizing him as much as I am, you know, thankful that he is having this transition and potentially his new content will outweigh that industrial side because I do truly think he is one of the main players in promoting that industrial style, uh, industrial style care, which I hope is going to be a way of the past eventually. Okay, so having said all of that, I think this is a great place to wrap this episode up. Um, thank you very much for listening. Hopefully this kind of changed the way you think about reptile enrichment if you're one of those that hasn't offered enrichment to your reptile hopefully this you know sparks some ideas now i guess the question is before i before i leave you is how do you how do you do this how do you you know add enrichment to your reptiles environment i would say there's a few things one you have to do research go learn about your species how they behave in the wild do they climb do they burrow do they hunt 
pick out a few behaviors that you would like to see your animal start to exhibit inside your enclosure. The second thing is make small changes and make slow changes. Don't expect that you can just throw in a thousand different things and your animal's just going to have a great time. Animal, you know, reptiles can take two, three, four months to get used to new things. They're very apprehensive. Some are, of, of course, some are totally fine. They jump on new things right away. Some are not. So, you know, if you want to add some climbing features, add some climbing features and then just wait. Don't add anything else. Give them eight weeks to see if they start using it. Don't put it in and then they don't use it the next day and then take it out. You got to give them some time to get used to it. So do your research, add things slowly. What you're looking to do is have different areas in the enclosure that will allow them to behave in a certain way. So climbing, um, a humid hide, you know, a lot of this stuff is just basic care, but a lot of us are forgetting to do it. And if you own snakes, remember the jury is out on whether or not they learn, but I do truly think they do. And don't let the lack of evidence make you assume that it's okay to keep them in a very plain, sterile environment. Now, like I said, maybe there's an exception if you're breeding a lot of animals, but if you only have a few, like maybe 10 or less, whatever whatever your number is, you need to make sure that you're offering them the ability to maximize their genetic potential. And you will not be doing that if you're, if you're leaving them in an absolutely plain, sterile, tubs-type industrial setup. It can be very difficult to understand how an animal thinks because we tend to you know personify them and and it's like really we have this brain in our head and the only way we can relate to other things is by using our brain obviously so we just assume that if an animal is going to learn it's going to learn similar to us that's not the case at all we don't really have a grasp of how snakes learn there's definitely learning going on like I, I hook train all my snakes if you want to watch that video on youtube you can see what i mean when i say i tap train or hook train my snakes i do truly believe that they get used to that tap and when they get tapped by the hook they know they're not being fed and they know they don't have to be defensive i have never been struck at by my snakes i've never been bit by my snakes and i i honestly think it's because they learn that that's that means that they're not being fed and they don't have to be scared it doesn't mean they know the snakes know me personally and they go oh hey there's dylan he's he's my owner it just means that that pattern of behavior is comforting to them that when they get tapped by the hook, they don't go, oh my God, what's happening? They go, they start to get used to that. Now, again, it's not that they like me as an owner. They don't know who I am, but that pattern of behavior is familiar to them. So anybody could come into my snake room and I'm guessing take my snake hook, tap a snake and pick it up without having any issues because they have learned that behavior. Now that is 100% subjective. Take that with a grain of salt, but uh, I do truly think that is the case. Okay, I am out of breath. I think that's the end. Uh, I have other things to do today, but I was really interested in, in recording this, so I, I hope that this is helpful to you. Um, if you want to support the show, make sure you go to animalsathome.ca slash podcast. There's a few different ways you can support. You can buy a shirt, and $5 gets donated to the Amazon Rainforest Conservancy, uh, or you can donate a couple bucks to me by buying me a coffee. That just helps pay for server fees and things along those lines. Uh, or just share the content. That is the biggest one, sharing on Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is. Uh, follow me on Instagram at animalsathomeca. And... Uh, can subscribe to me on YouTube at Animals at Home and I will talk to you later.